Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Savvy Cast. This is Jamie, and I'm so thrilled that you're here with us today, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast. Okay, I have some fan favorites back today. <laughs> Ellie Hiller and Gina Pitts from Vulcan Nutrition, and they are fan favorites. So girls, when y'all are on here, the numbers skyrocket. Everyone loves you all. So, uh, and and I'm sure y'all know Ellie's my daughter and I would take Gina as my daughter, but she's already <laughs> well loved by her mom. <laughs> but anyway, we are just going to jump on today, friends, to talk about some things that are newsworthy as of late, very hot news items. For those of you who may have seen the viral interview of Casey and Callie Means on Tucker Carlson, it's garnered millions and millions and millions of views. And for those of us maybe who couldn't watch the whole entire thing, Ellie and Gina are sort of going to break down some of what it entailed, why it's important, and how we can practically implement some of those things into our world. So thank you girls for being here today. Thanks for having us. We love being on the Savvy Cast. Y'all just start, one of you just start by sharing in a nutshell, this interview that has literally gone viral. And Ellie, you might want to hold up the book and tell yeah. about Callie and Casey, because I will say I'm blown away by her and her story and the story of her mom and all of that, but go ahead. I'll kind of introduce what, what, that podcast a little bit. And then Gina, maybe you can speak to what our goal with this podcast is specifically, um, as yes. you're not talking about, but okay. So the book is called good energy. I took the cover off. It's a lot prettier than this, but it's just easier to read. Mm -hmm. Um, so good energy is by Casey and Callie means. And in short, they have been on pretty much any health podcast you can find right now, but the one with Tucker Carlson really blew up and they really, really got into the weeds of who they are and why they're talking so much about what they're talking about. But Casey and Callie are brother and sister. And Casey was basically done with her medical residency when she decided just to drop everything and leave. Stanford, um, Stanford Medical. Mm -hmm. Yes, Stanford. And I believe it was um, like an ear surgery. ENT specialty, I believe. Like o otologist or something. But basically was done and walked into her supervisor's office and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to leave because she really was just so frustrated with why she didn't know. She couldn't understand why any of her patients were sick and why they had all of this inflammation. Specifically in her case, it was sinusitis and a bunch of um, nasal passage related inflammation. And she was like, okay, I can help fix them to a certain degree symptom wise, but we don't know what's causing all this inflammation. And so that is what basically in short led her on this basically root cause medicine journey, which you could also say is kind of functional medicine. They're kind of synonymous root cause and functional med. And then her brother Callie is he used to work for um, a lobbying company, a lot of more on the research side. And so he's really educated when it comes to who is funding who, who's funding research, what conflict of interest or potential conflict of interest are there when it comes to the studies that we're reading about our nutrition and health. And then to say it like, who's in bed with, with who, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of, um, we can get into this later, but um, he's exposing a lot of companies like Coca-Cola who are funding research from the uh, American Diabetic Association mm -hmm. to come out and say, oh, this diabetes water is really not that bad. It's more so a lack of physical activity that's causing people to be mm -hmm. obese or overweight when the reality is, is no, like, you know, sugar water has a huge impact even more so on all of these uh, diabetes, chronic disease, all that stuff. So he's, he's exposing a lot of that. The Which is basically there's big pharma and there's big food money being funneled into Lots of places that are affecting the, the information we get. Yes. And, and it's really sad. It, it is so sad for the American individual who's just like, I just want to, you know, read research and, and know what's right when it's like, there's all of these conflict of interest. And it's like, who do we believe, right? If we can't even trust these advocacy organizations like the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, all this stuff, then who the heck can we trust? So we'll get into that. But Gina, you speak to kind of, you know, what our goal is with this podcast. To piggyback off that, Ellie, we even like back and forth through voice memo because we're professional voice memoirs. We were <laughs> like, who do we believe? Who do we trust? Because I also look at a lot of different research and I'm hearing one thing from this group of people and then we hear them. So we're even like, 
there's something that we're missing here. So I think it's been really cool to learn more about their background. They don't really have a hidden agenda. So they, they're yeah. not tied. They don't have any affiliation with anyone. So I think for us, that's been cool because they're a reliable source because they're not getting paid by somebody else downstream. So after this, it's a two hour podcast. So it's a lot mm -hmm. of information to mm -hmm. digest. And it is about you know, the big food industry, but it's also big pharma. So there's some stuff we're not going to talk about specifically with the big pharma quite as much, but we really wanted to take the information that we gathered from the podcast because we agree a hundred percent with what they said. And we love them now. Like we're listening to everything they're putting out, mm -hmm. but there are some things that I think if the average person listened to you or you know, if you're a mom of four kids and you hear this, you're you, you don't want to mess up. I think is what it boils down to. So we wanted to take away the main points and kind of give advice on how you can implement what they've talked about and actually apply it to your everyday life. So let's, if y'all are good with this, let's start with the the lowest hanging fruit. Cause I think that's what everyone wants to know is like, okay, I've listened to this podcast. I'm terrified. Basically, what do I, where do I start? And I really think, and I know Gina would agree. It's it. Let's start with ultra, ultra processed food because you know, apart from the pesticides, apart from conflict of interest, all that stuff. Like, I think the ultra processed food is where we can start. So I'll just kind of throw out some of the points and then we can discuss in an open forum. But Casey, Casey brought up the point that since the dawn of ultra processed food, which is essentially, as they called it, an experiment, like, and it, it is an experiment on neurology, our appetite, our hormones, all this stuff to get us addicted to this food. They mentioned the link between the cigarette companies and the food industry and how the cigarette industry basically realized that they can create food that is just as addictive or even more so as a cigarette. And if you can create something that's addictive, you have a lot of profit potential. And so ultra processed food, we all know it's addicting, right? Like if, if I eat it often, I want it more. We're never satisfied with like, I can't eat one potato chip. It's just, it's hard to stop. Yes. And we will get into that because that's part of the experiment is that if we can keep you never really being full from it, because our body, it was not made to register from a satiety fullness standpoint. Oh, I'm full on potato chips. No, our satiety signals, those hormones are, are designed to respond to real food that we were made to eat. So then it's this double whammy of it's addicting, but I'm still not full. And so we just never really can stop. But basically they said, since the dawn of ultra processed food, our diet, our American diet is made up primarily of three things. That's processed sugar, ultra processed, refined grains, pretty much lacking all nutrients and fiber, um, and then seed oils. We can speak to this, but when I talk about ultra processed grain, I'm talking about like white flour because there's three parts of a grain. You have the brain, bran, endosperm, right. and the germ. And so white flour is just the endosperm. So you have taken mm -hmm. out all of the nutrients. And those three things are what our diet, American diet is essentially made up of. And um, I wanted to go back to the cigarette company because this part was really interesting to me. This all happened in the late 1980s, 1990s, when the Surgeon General put out the report that cigarettes are bad. So the cigarette industry was the biggest money market at the time, like everyone was smoking. And then they put out the report that, hey, cigarettes could cause cancer. You know, we need to put the warning on the packages now. And so all of the, the two biggest cigarette companies essentially bought out the food industry and used all those researchers previously developing cigarettes, all of the addictive nature like we were talking about. And now their job is to figure out how to make us addicted. So that we have people in factories trying to figure out how can we make all of us addicted to their product. And like we've talked about, we can't stop at one chip. It's, you know, you're reaching in and before you know what half the bag's gone. So I think we all know like innately what foods are, for lack of better terms, good and bad for us, right? Like we know, okay, if we reach for an apple, that's more nutritious than the bag of potato chips, but there's a reason why we're not doing it. And it's because of the addictive nature of the potato chip and the convenience of it. And can you all just, just at the outset of this conversation, define ultra processed and then maybe even compare it to processed. We know that a whole food is something that has a mother and comes from the ground. Is that right? Yeah, that, did you hear that from us? No, I heard that from my friend Deanna long ago when I was in Faster Way. It has oh. a mother and what else? It comes we from the ground. Yeah, yeah. Can, yeah, yeah. Does it have a mother? You can trace it back. To yeah, that's funny. No. Processed versus unprocessed. 
I mean, I know that's usually all, always involves cellophane or a package. I'll, I'll say something really short on this. L like, don't get into the weeds on it because everything, like your meat is processed, right? Like, you know, and, and that comes from an animal, right? We're not going out and shooting yeah, our yeah. skinning our own animal. So yeah, processed versus ultra processed. Think like ultra processed is 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 your um yes cellophane your your pastries your little debbies your cereals mm -hmm. your candy like the thing that is just so like it you can tell it just was created in a factory mm -hmm. yeah like it, something that was formulated from other obviously edible substances but it was like uniquely designed like you can't go outside to your backyard and find a cosmic brownie hanging from a branch like we know these things <laughs> yeah. are yeah yeah. specifically designed in a lab but yeah processed foods can be baby carrots right that's that's a processing part is to cut the carrots up small so processed foods is most of our foods whey protein that's right. processed like if you foods. kill a deer you're going to process the deer right. Right. yes yeah. okay. so ultra processed is more the package as people usually say the middle aisles of the grocery store if you're trying to visualize it and Mm -hmm. when you're going to go shopping. That yeah. makes sense. That's a good, good point. And here's one other thing I want to say on this that, that was so interesting when they brought up. They're, <laughs> they were speaking to the uh, the peer-reviewed research studies that um, a lot of academia is producing and all of these nutrition colleges and universities. And there's been over 50,000 peer-reviewed research studies. And they, they're like, why are we the only animal or the only species that is chronically diabetic, chronically obese, and chronically crippled by metabolic dysfunction? So we have all of this research floating around about nutrition, yet we are so sick, so overweight, and so unhealthy. And 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 that that goes back to ultra processed food. It's because animals aren't out there having to choose between ultra processed food and the food that is just available to them in their environment. It is actually impossible to overeat meat. Like, I think we all agree if, if I sat down at a table and I was just eating meat, like I am not going to sit there and eat myself to death on meat, but I can sit there and eat myself to death on a potato chip. Mm -hmm. So that is the problem is people are just not, we don't understand that it's not really food in our body. It is hijacking our body's biological signals and systems. And so that's really all I wanted to say about that. Unless there's anything else y'all want to speak to on ultra processed food, we can get into kind of how how to make choices there in a second. Yeah, I, that's all I had on that. I will say, I'll throw this in for any people who watch or listen to the podcast who follow me on Instagram, you'll be, you're aware that I have started milling my own flour. And Ellie, you just mentioned flour. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing when you have a bag of flour and then you mill your berries and you look at them and you feel the difference. Mm -hmm. It's mind blowing. Yeah. So even one small change, buying a simple meal and graining flour can eliminate even one third of that equation that is causing so much issue as far, you know, the ultra processed flours, the sugar and so forth. Right. And just to speak to that really quick. Okay. What if we don't mill our own flour? Like I wish I did, but you know, I don't. Process, okay, Dave's Killer Bread, for example, mm -hmm. the very highly seeded bread, Ezekiel, Ezekiel bread. You can Hero, buy Hero bread. Um, I'm not familiar with that, but but like a seeded bread, a, a seeded bread. So Ezekiel, let me speak to that. Very, very, um, it's still processed, but very rich in fiber and in whole grain and in nutrients. And then a white bread, like a Sarah Lee, completely stripped of all nutrients. So mm -hmm. yes, are they both processed? Yes. Is one ultra processed? Yes. So mm -hmm. if you're a mom just trying to figure out what bread to buy for your kids, let's go with the whole grain one with fiber, right? And even like, let's say you want to make your own bread and, but you're not milling your own flour. Like you can use almond flour, coconut flour. There's different things that you can bake with that, that you still get the nutrients from the almond and the coconut. So, mm -hmm. and even in her book, she was like, okay, refined grain, grain product on the left. What is the swap she would make on the right? Flour tortillas. Let's sub those for flax wraps or a high fiber wrap, spinach chickpea wrap. You can find all of these mm -hmm. in your grocery store. Yeah. Why yeah. White rice is a refined grain. What if we swapped with cauliflower rice or even broccoli rice and then pasta? Let's swap for spaghetti squash or zucchini noodles or even sweet potato noodles. So you could go on and on and on and even pizza crust. Mom, you do cauliflower pizza crust often, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. 
So there, and it's actually just as good or better than, you know. Yeah. And have you ever cooked with good. like a, an almond flour crust? Have you ever done that for pizza? No, yeah. but I've done a sourdough crust and those are super mm. easy. If you keep sourdough, I mean, super easy. Yeah. 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 So um, her book has a ton of, of good swaps in there, but that's where I would start when it comes to bread. But then as, as for just grocery store shopping to avoid ultra processed food, people have heard this, I know, but if you stay on the perimeter of the grocery store, you're pretty much going to get every, everything on the perimeter is going to be your best bet, right? You have your dairy, you have your produce section, you have your meat section. Um, if you're going in those center aisles, it needs to be very limited, hopefully just like your condiments and maybe like your pickles or the things that are still um, have a long shelf life, but it's not something ultra processed. You can still find good things on the inner aisles, but not a majority of your food. So. I do want to say, Ellie, I'm surprised you haven't heard of it because I've talked about it a million times. Hero Bread. It It's literally, have you heard of it, Gina? I have. And there's one other one they just came out with. Is it super high fiber? It, there's 12 grams of fiber per yeah. slice. And, it t- and I'm saying this for the parents. Your children <laughs> will have no clue. They are not eating white bread. Or there's one that's seeded, but it's blowing everybody away and they make hot dog buns, hamburger buns. So you're getting your whole five days of fiber almost with one sandwich. So that's just a, a brand to look for if you want to implement it with picky children. Yeah, so, they have they have tortillas too. I'm they have tor- Yeah, I've got them all in my freezer. I, I had buy one, get one. I know pu- my Publix carries them. Sprouts carries the most, at, at least here in Birmingham, but it's mind blowing. It tastes just like normal bread but it's loaded with fiber and ellie i know i've shared this tip before but something that's super helpful like if you are no i if you have no idea when you're looking at a food label hey is this considered a high fiber food is to add a zero next to the fiber so let's say there's four grams of fiber in it which is pretty standard for just a regular seeded bread like dave's killer or ezekiel if you add a zero to your fiber and it's greater than the total carbs that would check off as a high fiber source so when you're scanning the grocery aisles if they don't have the super high fiber hero bread and you're trying to figure out other alternatives that's a quick just check and if it meets that standard i would say that's typically a a safe bet because if there's fiber they haven't refined the grain so much to where they've stripped all the nutrients away okay so we talked a little bit about this off air so y'all are going to hear me repeat myself but this part was so fascinating in the podcast uh do y'all know what the fastest growing industry in the united states is right now fastest growing industry Mm -hmm. healthcare (laughs) gina (laughs) healthcare (laughs) yeah so like, it's not AI, it's not tech, it's not all the things that I think we would think it is, it's healthcare. And then you need to start asking the question, why? Like, why is healthcare the largest growing industry right now in the United States? Number one, we're sicker than ever, but number two, they speak a lot about this, so I won't belabor the point, but the sicker people can get the earlier in life, the longer time you have a, a, a profitable patient, right? So mm-hmm. if a child becomes really sick, then now they say it like this, they're on the treadmill of big pharma and big food for the rest of their life, right? You have a very Mm -hmm. profitable patient. And so I was very interesting once Callie started talking about um, Coca-Cola, for example, and how he was talking through their donations and he's like, follow the money, right? So in 2009, Coca-Cola made the largest individual donation of a million dollars to support a British nutrition foundation who stated on their website, their mission is to translate evidence-based nutrition science into stuff that is engaging engaging and actionable. So this company that's translating evidence-based science, their biggest funder was Coca-Cola. You have to ask the question, what in the world would Coca-Cola be donating to them for? It's a nutrition. Mm -hmm. And, And the reason is to make it sound like their product is not as bad for people as it really is. And then Coca-Cola gave the second largest individual donation of almost half a million dollars to an international network called EPODE that aims to prevent childhood obesity. And so so basically now all we'll see the American um, Diabetic Association come out and say Coke's not as bad as, as everyone says it is, that the main problem with um, obesity is a lack of physical activity. So it's like a diversion of, okay, this, this organization that we trust to give us good quality research is now in a conflict of interest with the companies that are their biggest donors, right? And so that was just really fascinating when you're knowledgeable about that. I think it just goes back to being like, we all know Coke is not good for us. 
right? So like an article from the ADA shouldn't change our mind, but it the reality is, is that it, it does for people because mm -hmm. people are looking for ways to justify continuing to drink Coke, continuing to give it to their kids. It makes them happy, all this stuff. Gina, anything you wanted to say on that? Yeah, it's very fascinating. And it speaks to the fact that not that kids are the only target, but just like you said, the goal is for the industry to make us sick enough so we're having to be on medications, but not kill us. Mm -hmm. And so targeting kids at a younger age is a great person if you're looking to make money because they have their entire life, right, to be on these medications. And 70% of children's diets are from packaged foods, which would be those ultra processed foods, which is extremely alarming. And over 50% of kids are considered obese. So mm -hmm. it's a huge problem and not to super tie into like, the big pharma stuff, but it it's all tied back to, you know, getting these kids on medications. And then we put them in a classroom for eight hours a day. And they talk in the podcast about how kids are indoors more than a prisoner, which mm -hmm. is insane. So kids are inside all day. They're having to sit in a classroom. They're giving ultra processed foods for 70% of what they eat in a day. Then they get put on ADHD medication because they can't, you know, they're wound up. And it's like, Mm -hmm. duh like I mean I don't know what else to say like you you do that to a lab rat and they're gonna go bonkers too and so it's just again follow the money but what we are doing to our kids is so unhelpful you get them addicted to ultra processed foods they're obese by the time they're six seven eight and mm -hmm. you set them up for the rest of their life to to have a struggle with that which we're not saying that there's not a struggle involved for some people because it is a, it can be a very difficult thing, but when they're already obese at six, it's yeah. really difficult to get out of that. And, and they said that a pediatrician before the 1950s would have seen probably about 1% of their population having prediabetes or diabetes. And now um, it's 50% of American adults that have prediabetes or diabetes. So half of America has it and 30% of teens. So it, it's just fascinating. And then we know that 74% of Americans are overweight or obese. And then pre 1950s, you know, they mentioned like you would only see someone overweight, like in the circus as a sideshow. Yeah. Right. And so, and this mm -hmm. is not to be shameful or anything. Like it is 100%, like we are at a disadvantage in our food culture today. Like it is terribly hard to make de good decisions, right? Because everything is coming at us and a lot of people just don't know what to do, right? And y'all aren't parents yet, but let me just say this. If you're realizing that, oops, I need to make changes, you're going to have a battle because your, mm -hmm. your children love, and, and I'm telling you, they're going to throw themselves in the floor. They're going to go find it at school. They're going to act the, the devil <laughs> at, at first, <laughs> I mean, y'all, I'm serious. Now, some children may be acquiescent. Well, well, maybe your baby sister. No, I, I never tried to take one. But if you have kids who are addicted and they 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 love their Cheetos and they're used to having a cup, and y'all, the juice boxes, I mean, all of that stuff, if you decide, which we all should, hey, okay, I'm just going to use your dad is an example, Ellie, bad A1C. And this morning he said, if my blood work doesn't come back, he says, I've made some changes because it's all diet. It's all diet, just like obesity. He said, if I don't have drastic changes, instead of these little changes, I'm going to go scorched earth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to have to decide if with your kids, am I going to try to slowly implement this or just, but the fact is there's so many wonderful choices now that they don't have to suffer, but there will be a little hump probably when you're transitioning them to the poison, to the good stuff. Yeah. And I, I was talking to a parent the other day, cause I'm not one, but we were on this same uh, topic and 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 they they brought up a good point. They're like, yes, it's very hard at first. Um, even if you use swaps, like, you know, there's, there's almost like, um, they're creating these chickpea uh, Cheetos. You mentioned Cheetos, but you know, um, there's like these like good alternatives. Yeah. Their lunch all crunch think they're very yeah. good. Yes. <laughs> I've got some in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like, they were talking about how they're making these swabs and, and transitioning more to, to Whole Foods. And they're like, yeah, it's really, really hard at first, but they eventually get used to it. If that is all that's there, you know, it's like, okay, they learn to love it. And yes, can they find it at school? Can they find it at other kids' house? Yes. I think it's just important to have an open discussion and not like scare them about these foods, but just like 
yeah, if, if your kids are old enough, like be open with them and say, we're not trying to like hide this good stuff from you. Cause they're going to go to a friend's house and, and gorge. Right. If they think that they can never have it. Like Sean, my husband talked about how, you know, his mom only ever had skim milk. And then the first time he had whole milk, whole milk at his friend's house, you know, he couldn't get enough of it. And he would go over there just to drink all their whole milk. Right. Like, and so it's like, but then once he realized, you know, he wasn't being deprived and that that's just what they were going to buy was the skim milk. He, he was totally fine, but I just, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if that helps at all, but I think just know it's going to be hard at first, but then if that's all that's available for dinner and they have nothing else to eat, they're going to learn to eat it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and thankfully there's never been a better time in the history of the world to have options that taste Yes. Not only as good, but even better yeah. than the junk. So, okay, do you want to get into the real quick the organic versus non organic pesticide stuff? Because this is sure. really yeah, that that's key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is really confusing for people. Gina, you and I've talked a lot. Do you want to start with this? <laughs> yeah. So I think with first of all, if you're going to make one change, like we said before, we started that long <laughs> discussion start with the ultra processed foods. So, mm -hmm. like, if we're talking about pesticides, and you're like okay, I can't afford to, to buy organic. Well, don't just not buy the fruits and vegetables because of that, but start with ultra processed foods. So pesticides, this was very, very interesting. And I can't even speak, Ellie, to like the specific names of some of the pesticides. And I don't know if you remember, but Roundup is one, yeah. But they were talking about this one specific one and how if you sprayed it on a frog embryo, it would turn a male frog into a female. Yes. And yeah. how a lot of our issues with just, you know, infertility has skyrocketed. Sperm counts have been going down. They said one person every single year. And puberty is six years earlier in girls. Like the average age is 10 to 13, they said. So, I mean, there's no disputing that we are having problems with both male and female reproductive systems. And a lot of that can be tied back to the types and the quantities of pesticides being sprayed on these fruits and vegetables and they're they've been given to us or we've bought them some exchange from other countries that have banned them mm -hmm. so it's like we're we're taking something from a country that has created a product that is illegal for them but they're glad that we are filling our our crops with that so I found it just for FYI it's yes. astrazine and it's primarily used on corn crops yeah, so very, very interesting. But so all of our foods are sprayed with pesticides. I mean, there's not really any way to get around that fact. Very alarming that other countries have banned it and we have not. But we we don't want to scare people like, oh, you have to buy organic or don't eat them at all. There are ways to get around this. Like we'll talk about techniques to to wash your fruits and veggies to, to clean them better. But Ellie had a great suggestion of if, you know, you can't afford to buy all organic, even just starting with like the dirty dozen list would be a, a really good first step versus swapping everything and also buying frozen. Frozen actually saves you a ton of money. The nutrient quality and quantity in frozen is sometimes even better than fresh because they flash freeze it at the peak ripeness. Mm -hmm. So frozen is also a really great option if that's a way that you can, it's more affordable for you and you can save money doing that. And you want me to quickly go through the dirty dozen? Yes, go yeah. through the dirty dozen. One thing I'll say on it though, don't people, we'll talk about washing in a second, but people are like, oh, well, I'll just shave the, the skin off the apple. No, because then you're getting rid of all the fiber. And in my that's opinion, right. that, that is like a-, a Yeah. A, net zero right so don't be so afraid of pesticides that we'll talk about washing but mom go ahead and, and do that okay, okay. and the, i'm starting with number one i don't know if there's any order but strawberries spinach kale collard and mustard greens grapes peaches pears nectarines apples bell and hot peppers cherries green beans one thing i'll, I'll point out about that just so people notice those those dirty dozen are a lot of like quote unquote soft like fruits and veggies kind of like just think about a very penetra penetrable um exterior you know like a strawberry you know you can when, when they're very ripe they're so soft it, it's just like stuff almost just like would ooze in if, if, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good analogy but then when you look at the clean um 15 a lot of these have like hard shells and um Thing, like it's uh pineapple um onions like you can peel off an outer layer avocado no one eats the skin of an avocado 
honey, honeydew, melon, kiwi, cabbage, mushrooms, mangoes, watermelon, carrots. So a majority of those, like, yes, we're taking the peel off already. So just kind of keep in mind, like my, my tip for this is, is I don't buy organic, all organic. I can't afford all organic, but what I do is when I do buy organic, I stick to the things on the dirty dozen mm -hmm. and, and I really wash them well. Um, and we'll talk about that, but, but I think that's the, that's what I'm passionate about telling people and my clients is like, Hey, if you can afford all organic, that's amazing. But very few people can. Yeah. So why would I buy an organic avocado when I'm like not mm -hmm. even eating the skin anyway? And it's very, it very, there's hardly ever any pesticides found on those. Um, same thing for like watermelons and, and melons. Mm -hmm. So make yourself acquainted with those lists and then triage accordingly for, for what you're going to spend some extra money on. In the podcast, they talked about how, I don't know if they only shop at farmer's markets or what their plan is. I love that idea. I don't have a farmer's market where I'm located, especially every, I mean, I know there's one every month. There is not one I can go to every single week. So if that's you, don't freak out and think you're doing everything wrong. Like we've said a million times, we know that some of this stuff can't be taken from, oh, my kid eats 70% packaged foods to now they put 0% in their body. Like there is a middle ground here because- mm -hmm. That's just the reality of life. Like there's going to be a time where you're going to have to go through the fast food drive through again. We want to make this practical and actually useful and not, oh, I only can shop at farmer's markets and everything has to be organic because I can't do that. I can't afford all organic and I can't go to a farmer's market every single week. And so like Ellie said, buy from the organic from the dirty dozen if you can, buy from the frozen section. If you know someone who is selling like a half a cow where you can buy in bulk, that's also a really good way to save on meat. And you know, like the source is a little bit better than just your meat coming from China. Yeah. And and I will say too, to the point about farmer's markets. And then if, if you have a friend who, who sell, who has chickens or you can buy meat from people like regenerative farming, number one, it's, I love supporting local. I love supporting mm -hmm. people who have a family owned farm and the stuff tastes better anyway. Oh my but goodness. Yeah. If you can find someone who has a regenerative farm or runs one or knows of one, um, you you know, you're going to get the best soil. Typically they mm -hmm. avoid synthetic pesticides, obviously just talk to them and ask if you're not sure. Um, but then, you know, focusing on soil health, we know our nutrients in the food that we're growing has a lot to do with the soil that we're using. And so that is, if you can get to know people at your farmer's market, get to know people with farms, all that stuff as crazy and homestead as that sounds it is so worth it and then you know hey I'm supporting local but also I know how my food is being grown <laughs> like, Ellie it's actually becoming the trend and I'm going to throw this out because anywhere anybody might be that's watching or listening and I'm going to put a link to this in the show notes Azure Standard A-Z-U-R-E Azure Standard it is an online co-op and it's based out of Oregon but I started ordering my wheat berries there butter and some things and when I went you go once a month to a drop in a city near you and almost every place has them yes. there you, yes eggs there you will meet people who will give you tip I had a sweet lady named Jane she gave me tips who would sell a cow so that is a great azure standard and guys best butter I've ever eaten in my life they pull up they're a Christian family they ship all over the United States and everything, you know, it's organic. So that is a way, that's a good start. And I, William Latham's mother was there, Ellie, you remember him from, yeah. and her husband's a doctor, but when he's not doctoring, they have started a farm, started all this. And she said, Jamie, everything, you wouldn't believe the people who are coming and asking, can we get eggs? It's a, it's trending. People are understanding now that's the way to go. And you can find those people. You just have to start with where they are. And, and then you're right. It's not as expensive as people think. Like no, if no. just doing your produce and your meat. And mm -hmm. even like, I knew so many people that have gardens in a raised flower bed now, mm -hmm. like if you keep it, I forgot, Gina, it might've been you I was talking to you, but if it's raised, like you're, you're going to already eliminate a certain number of pests that might get into it. Right. So, yeah. so I just think, yeah, it does sound a little crazy because all we've ever known is to go in the grocery store and get what we need. But now that so much is coming out, it, that is your right mom. That's the way places are going. And mm -hmm. it's pretty cool to know the chicken's name that hatches the eggs that, <laughs> You know, you're eating. Colin, I mean, Colin the chicken. Remember, there's a commercial once. No, 
but chicken's name was Colin. Oh, yeah. Um, it was funny. But no, guys, I'm telling you, and I'm going to put a link and I encourage everyone and I'll have a discount code there. You can buy anything, mm -hmm. anything there. Raw milk, raw cheese, regular cheese. And a lady there told me, she said, I get this cheese now that used, I used to get at Sprouts and it's cheaper. Yeah. And you're supporting local people, you know, from all over. So it's not as hard as it might look. And the more you get into it, the more you can make connections. Yes. Um, Gina, will you talk about how you wash your produce so we don't forget to do that? Yes. Okay. So the first thing is if you don't have like glass storage containers, that's step one. You need to purchase those. Um, because to touch on something really quick they talked about was our exposure to plastics is insanely high some things we really can't control like in the water unless you have a specific filtration system but in the air but every single thing we get out of grocery stores in a, a plastic some type of a package even our fruits and vegetables are wrapped in it it lines the cans of things we drink and then if we store products in it our food products that's another expo exposure so i would suggest buying glass storage containers when you come home from the store rinse your your produce whatever it is with water and baking soda i let that sit for a few minutes and then i like really rinse it off good I what rinse, ratio gina i just dump Do you I probably, just put them yeah yep yeah, i just dump in the the container rinse them let it soak for two to three minutes and then i rinse them good again i line a glass container with a paper towel mm -hmm. and put the berries or whatever into that it absorbs the moisture. So if you have berries that go bad really fast, they usually last up to two weeks if you if you clean them that way. So less um, waste if you clean them and store them properly. And I know yeah. they have specific fruit and vegetable cleaners too. I can't speak to those. I've never used them, but I'm sure you could purchase one of those and it would do something similar. And I leave a baking soda in a mason jar right by my water spout just so I don't forget. And I just dump too. But it's crazy how much comes off. Like I have this little yeah. salad spinner and you will see so much come off of that. And honestly, I think it makes the berries taste better because it gives it almost this like sharpness. Um, yeah. I, I think it tastes great too. So, but rinse under running water for a good bit after that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's good. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Yeah, that's I do good. have, I do have a question about plastic. If it says, like, I put my sourdough in these containers from um, Dollar Tree, but it says BPA-free food grade, is that okay? Um, I mean, I know if it says BPA-free, I know BPA is one of the number one things that Casey says in her book to avoid. But, I mean, best case scenario would be, in my opinion, something glass. But Are I'm Ziplocs a no-no, even if you don't heat them in the microwave? I would say your BPA-free is better than a Ziploc. Yeah, I would say the same. Okay. Yeah, there's just a certain level that you're not going to be able to avoid everything, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess, Ellie, what would you say would be your number one way to make this practical for someone? Like we just gave a lot of really great tips, but for someone that's like, okay, I have, you know, three kids in that are younger, they eat a lot of packaged foods, where would we, and obviously we've, we've talked about minimizing ultra processed foods, but like they're at 70%. Obviously, going to 0%, we've talked about, they're just going to go to a friend's house and eat everything they see. So, like, where is the middle ground? I mean, my number one thing would say, okay, like, let's just look at, just look at where you shop. Let's just change where you shop, maybe, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, from there, you're, it's even just going to naturally limit some of your options. Let's say you only do the farmer's market and maybe you get your meat from somewhere else. That's very extreme. But, you know, th that it alone would condense a lot down. Maybe it's just a transition, though, from Walmart to Sprouts. Maybe you just start there. Like and Ellie, that. let me say this, and I'm not a huge Walmart shopper. I mean, I do order online, but they have a lot of organic now at Walmart. Yeah, yeah. So yes. It's becoming more mainstream. 100%. I was just saying, like, if you're kind of confused on, oh, my goodness, like, what do I even buy? Like, if you just yeah. don't have the knowledge yet, if you change where you maybe shop, that'll limit some of the the options. But I agree with you. You can find some very affordable organic produce at, at uh, Walmart. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I would just say the ultra processed food, like trying to look at each meal and maybe even just know if you can identify, like, do I have in my kid's lunchbox, what is ultra processed in here? Well, I know we talk about the plate method a lot, but I think it's really helpful to even for a really simple reference, like we could even put that in the show notes, what we use for the plate method. But if you just can visualize a plate, 
half of your plate should be some type of a non-starchy vegetable. So like think your colorful foods. Can you fill half of your plate with that? The other half, the top portion should be your serving of protein. So a quarter of your plate should be your protein. And then that bottom corner should be like your starchy carb, potatoes, rice, some type of your grain. And then typically we're cooking in a fat. So I don't always have to recommend adding that to your meal. But if your kid always has an ultra processed food at each meal, maybe start by asking them which one they would would want to remove. Instead of going cold turkey, like getting their input and asking them which one they would want to maybe do away with for now. Mm -hmm. um, so they're still getting at least something, not that they need it, but you know, they're going to ask for it. So a way to make it practical would be to maybe ask them, get their input as to what we could take away from maybe their lunchbox and stop packing that and then kind of trickle down from there. I think cold turkey, I don't have kids either. I don't know if that would be effective, but I think maybe the slow elimination to the, to the point where you're, you're kind of at that 80, 20, I know that rule gets thrown around all the time, but if 70% right now are from ultra processed foods, we kind of have to do the exact opposite, right? We need 80% from whole foods and only 20% from ultra processed. And, and even mom, like last thing I will say on this, but we sat down for dinner pretty much every night that's not practical for everyone. Totally understand. But it was cool because it made me crave meals that were, mm -hmm. you know, made by, by your hand. You worked so hard to cook meals that did follow the plate method for us. And it was an awesome time of fellowship, really enjoying the food that you worked very hard over. And I think that ties a lot of positive, even just dopamine responses to a mm -hmm. high quality, high quality meal. Um, I looked forward to that every night. Mm -hmm. So if, if that were to show up in my lunchbox the next day, I would be really happy with it, you know? And so mm -hmm. maybe that's a good place to start is try to incorporate a few more family meals in the week. If you can, I know not every mom is able to do that, but that, that would go a long way in kind of acclimating um, your child to that. Yeah. And approach it from a positive, you know, like it, we're not taking away, we're, we're replacing with something that's going to make you so much stronger and healthier mm -hmm. and um, yeah, there's, there are ways uh, and it's a brief, once they acclimate to the healthier food though, I think they'll crave those more. It's a process for sure. So guys, this has been so helpful and I think we could keep talking forever, but I know y'all have got other things. So why don't we circle back and do another one soon and just yes. offer some more tips. Yes. yes. Link to the, the show they did with Tucker, because that was fascinating i will link yeah. to the um two hour episode with tucker i'll also link to her book which i'm actually gonna buy when does she do an audible oh i'm sure it's like number one on amazon right now yeah i'm, I'm gonna get that as soon as we get off and um but, but you might want to buy a hard copy because it's actually one of the, it's more like a textbook so like she has recipes in the back um, oh then i'm gonna get a heart yeah yeah I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this was not one i would listen to Okay. Okay. Thank you for that tip. Then I'll, I'll order it. So, well, ladies, thank you. I so appreciate it and enjoyed it as always. And until next time, thank you. Everyone. Have a fabulous rest of your day. Hi everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Cast. If you'll take the time to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, that would mean so much. As always, thank you for listening and have a blessed day.